Department. Well, let's get Labour's take uh, on all of that uh, now, uh, shall we? We're joined by the Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Pat McFadden. Uh, thank you very much for being on the programme uh, today. Um, I know you were across the James Cleverly uh, interview. What, what's your reaction to it? Well, look, I wish we were talking about other things. Um, you know, we've I think had you might do as well. things to say yesterday about the cost of living crisis and energy bills and so on. Uh, I think the problem with these things, if you take these different stories together, is that it's very easy for the public to conclude they're all the same, they're all in it for themselves. And I think with the Boris Johnson stuff, he almost relies on that level of cynicism uh, so that people conclude no scandal matters, nothing matters, because that's what they're like anyway. And I feel more than the individual cases, this is really corrosive to governance and government. There are big problems facing the country. Uh, we need good government. And I think it would be a tragedy if the result of all this was for people to just simply turn away from politics and say they're all a bunch of crooks and knaves. Now, uh, important to say Boris Johnson's spokesperson says the story is rubbish, that Richard Sharp didn't give him any financial advice, there hasn't been any remuneration for Richard Sharp. You've reported Boris Johnson to the Parliamentary Commissioner for Standards. Uh, why have you done that? Uh, we've done that because we think this needs to be looked into. Uh, Boris Johnson's spokesperson said, uh, so what, big deal, which actually sums up his whole response to all of these things over the last couple of years. On the specifics of this, uh, the allegation is that the chairman of the BBC acted as a broker to uh, help facilitate a, a loan of £800,000 to Boris Johnson while he was a candidate to become uh, the chairman of the BBC. That's not just Labour that said this. We understand the Cabinet Office actually intervened to say that this uh, arrangement couldn't continue because he was a candidate to become chairman of the BBC. So obviously that begs, begs big questions about uh, what was going on here and that's why we've uh, made that reference. Now, Richard Sharp says that there wasn't a, a conflict uh, of interest. We heard James Cleverly there uh, saying that Richard Sharp is a man of you know, great integrity, uh, that he understands why he was given uh, the role. Is the BBC impartial? Well, look, you know, I'm not here to have a pop at the BBC, but I do think it's pretty extraordinary if someone who was running to be the chairman ends up acting as a broker to help the Prime Minister of the day out of whatever financial difficulties he was in. Uh, at the very least, that should all have been declared and brought into the open. There's nothing in Boris Johnson's declaration of interest as an MP about this. It's been brought into the open by uh, journalism, uh, not by people being transparent. And that's why I do think this does need to be looked into. OK, uh, as you say, um, you're calling for the investigation. They say uh, that the story uh, isn't uh, accurate. So uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, let's talk about Nadim Zahawi, uh, shall we? Um, James Cleverly says that he will survive till Prime Minister's questions on Wednesday. What, what's your take? I think it's difficult for uh, Mr Zahawi because the, the, the problem with this is what we're being asked to believe. Uh, and uh, we're being asked to believe that he had this asset worth £27 million that he didn't really know was his and therefore didn't really know uh, tax was due on it. And the thing about his statement issued yesterday is that he was using pretty heavy legal letters to try to get people to be quiet about this back in July uh, to Dan Needle, the tax expert who exposed some of this, uh, to newspapers like The Independent, threatening legal action. And then we're asked to believe that it's all just carelessness. That doesn't quite fit. So I think this is quite difficult for him now. Um, Rishi Sunak, is there a question mark about what he knew? James Cleverly said, look, I don't know anything about this. All, all I know is what is in Nadeem Zahawi's statement. Um, but he's obviously you know, cabinet uh, minister. He's, he's a party chairman under Rishi Sunak. Is it a problem for the prime minister too? Well, I think it is, because when he came into office, he promised a new broom on all this, that after the Boris Johnson days, when propriety and ethics had been in the news almost every day through one scandal or another, uh, that he would 
you know, turn over a new leaf, there'd be a new page and so on. So I think this is a test of that. Uh, and if you've got someone who is negotiating all this while he was the Chancellor, threatening people with uh, legal action and then coming to the conclusion that uh, he's owed millions of pounds uh, to the to the tax uh, man and probably with a penalty in it as well. We, we don't know for sure, but it looks that way. I think this is a question for the Prime Minister as well, because what does that new broom, that turning the page on the propriety and ethics questions mean if this is just shrugged off? And we should say, of course, Nadim Zahawi's uh, statement point to, towards his statement yesterday where he says that his taxes are you know, now up to date, that he reached the settlement with HMRC to do that. Do you think that actually we're getting to a stage now where high-profile politicians should actually just publish their tax returns? Maybe they should. I've got no problem with that. Um, what, what concerns me more uh, about this is what I said at the beginning, uh, that the public will just conclude everybody's at it in some way. Well, that's the way to, uh, to counter that, though, right? Well, to, to it be, might, it transparency, might, to shine a light be, on it. It may be on tax, as I say. You know, I would have no problem with that, but these scandals are not just about tax returns. With Boris Johnson question that we're discussing today is about something else. What I'm more concerned with is that people give up on politics and that would be really bad for the country because there are plenty of serious issues that need good governance and need politics to address them. Uh, the cost of living crisis is one. The situation in the NHS is another. There is plenty to be doing here and I don't want people to think Politics can't have any solutions because they're all in it for themselves. Well, let's talk about some of those serious issues now, uh, shall we? And the NHS, you mentioned, uh, we of course seen the strike action uh, from nurses and ambulance workers too. We'll be talking to Unite Sean Graham shortly. Nurses have signalled that they would accept a pay rise of around 10%. Would Labour grant that? Uh, I've been doing interviews on this for three months, and every time a journalist has asked me what's the percentage, I've had to point out this has got to be negotiated between the employers, the government and the union. I'm not going to give a percentage today. The important thing is that staff in these sectors get a decent pay rise. What is a decent because, pay rise then? Because these strikes... What, what, genuinely, what, what, what do you think is a decent pay well, rise Well, you know, it has to be negotiated. I'm not going to yeah, give sure. a figure. But, but um, you just said that staff need to be given yeah, a decent pay rise. Well, literally, what is a decent they do. pay rise? Well, that's got to is be that, negotiated. Is that matching inflation? Is that, that's got to be it? negotiated around the, uh, the table. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's a, obviously it has to be negotiated. Yes. That's, that's a clearly a fact. But I just wonder, you know, if you say that journalists have been asking you this question for three months. Yeah. Do you think that's because we're not getting an answer? We, we don't know what Labour would give. Is a fair pay rise 2%? Is a fair pay rise 12%? I can name any percent you want to do. Yeah, that'd be great, 10, actually. Thank you. 20, 50. And the fact is, because we're in opposition, it doesn't get the nurses an extra penny. Well, it might do a lot to help but, them if Labour came out with a policy. You, no, Labour coming out with a percentage doesn't make any difference to these strikes. What would make a difference uh, in the longer term is a government that really backed public services. And that's what we did when we were in government. We didn't have these uh, strikes. We managed to give people both decent pay rises and fund the public services properly. And that's what we'll do if we get elected, because the problem so for you, the if NHS... You fund, if you fund the public services properly, then, would you be prepared to give more money to the NHS? The problem for the NHS is not just the current industrial dispute. The problem for the NHS is that even when there isn't a strike day, we've got 7 million people on waiting lists. So what we've said is staffing is at the heart of this. We need to train more doctors. We need to train more nurses. We need to change the way the system works. Our ambition isn't just to save this service, it's to renew it for the future. We've said how we'll do that, we've said how we'll fund that. There's got to be a longer-term solution to public services other than just a short-term ambition to get through the strikes. Sure, but I guess what the nurses' unions would say uh, is that it's not just a short-term ambition, this is all about the workforce, right? And That's if people right. feel that they're not getting paid a fair amount, then they're going to leave, which is what's happening right now. They've got a recruitment crisis. And I have to say, you know, Labour say, look, you know, we get around the table and negotiate, uh, we would be give a fair deal to nurses. But if you look at the actual meat of what you're saying, I can't work out how it's different from the government because you, you won't put a figure on, on what you do. A figure from opposition would be pretty meaningless uh, because we're not a party to the negotiations. When we were in government, we managed to negotiate decent pay rises for NHS staff and fund the service 
properly. Uh, you know, these days they're talking about an ambition of getting a GP appointment in two weeks. When we were in office, it was within 48 hours. That's the difference that can be made. But I've got to also be honest with your viewers. After 13 years, the situation that we inherit won't be turned around overnight. It will take time to rebuild the NHS. And that's why we've put this issue of staffing and training more doctors and nurses at the heart of our proposals, because there is no solution to the long-term problems of the NHS without addressing staffing. Pay is an issue. Of course, it's an issue with inflation running at the levels it is today. But it's not just about pay. It's about short staffing on wards. It's about waiting lists with just not enough people in the service uh, to deal with them. So we need to deal with that and renew the NHS so that it can really be the 21st century health service that we need. OK, thank you very much for being on the programme at this morning. Pat McFadden there uh, for uh, the Labour Party.